Greetings Church, it's uh, Kevin Duclaren once again. Today is, uh, I believe it's Tuesday, the 29th of January, 2019. And um, let's just make, just been taking pictures here of the area and of this here. This is the, uh, this is the tithing, uh, this is the tithing basket, which never gets filled with anything. Um, <laughs> this is the poster that will be that we're using for Romans, Romans chapter 1 verses through 16, God's love letter to a Gentile church under a tyrannical empire. And uh, here is the 16 chapters that I've summarized. You can see them right there. And here is the uh, information about the church and um, the, the postal box that you can use right underneath with my photograph in it. Um, there's no activity in Portland right now. And um, Another thing I wanted to show you is uh, this is what I'm using to carry um, the poster board. Uh, it's uh, so I, I'm kind of using this. Uh, this is for the tithing, trying to encourage the church, reminding the church that uh, there needs to be tithing, um, sort of like uh, support for the. Uh, for the preaching ministry right here uh, God commands it God demands it that the church be supported um, and then of course on this side as I've shown you I showed it to you last year on this side is this you know I will build my church uh, from Matthew 16 18 um, and the question is Americans will you be his church today so um, that's pretty much it let's see um, what, whatever they give, this is what it's going to be for, copyright, uh, to, to basically register this series. It's, it costs $55 uh, every time you uh, send something to the copyright office, whether it be video or books, uh, to register the sermons and uh, the book itself is going to cost money. Uh, you can see it here. The pulpit has already been purchased, so you, uh, that I can check off. Um, to print, I have to print two Roman books two copies of these once it's completed. Uh, I have to buy a flash drive, it's gonna cost $39. Uh, it's 128 gigabytes and then of course a bunch of other stuff and then probably get some coffee afterwards. Um, and the scriptures that I have down here to support uh, the giving that, the that I'm asking the church to give is 1 Timothy 5, 17 through 18, uh, the double honor worthy of wages, 1 Corinthians 9, 14, uh, living from the gospel and 2 Corinthians 9, 7, be a cheerful giver. So, as I am doing this ministry here, I'm starting it to, I'm, I'm, well, this will be my fifth video. Uh, I started it last year. I'm kind of reluctant um, in, in, in wanting to get started because the people don't really respond to the gospel. Um, and so it's kind of discouraging because, you know, you've been doing this for so long and everybody is like talking to a poll and nobody ever responds, you know. Um, and when they do response, it's in uh, negativity, uh, rejection. They don't want to hear it. Uh, they send somebody to insult you to your face. Um, you know, they tell you you're not a Christian leader and you're a homosexual and so on and so forth. And, it, it, and it's, it's heartbreaking because it's like, well, what are you expecting God to send you? You know, if he sent you, even Superman um, has, a, has a weakness for kryptonite, right? Um, <laughs> so... I, no matter no matter how high up you go in uh, in leadership, our president, what was the weakness? Sexual immorality. Um, and how many presidents do we know of that has a weakness for sexual immorality? So even the greatest of kings, you know, Caesar, uh, he had a weakness uh, that led him to being stabbed to death uh, by uh, one of by all of, of the Senate. And so it doesn't matter what the leadership is or who the leadership is. There's going to be some sort of a a downfall. There's going to be some sort of a downfall, and who knows what's going to happen. Um, this is the book that I'm using. It's, uh, I haven't been working on it um, at all. I've been at the library just watching movies, and um, this, is the, this is the book. It has each chapter in it. I've summarized each chapter, and in so... And in so... And in so doing, um, I'm not sure what's going on. There it is. That's, that's the reason why I was reluctant to come out. There is uh, there's slow, uh, there's a slow group of people over there and one of the slow guys came and uh, 
he wasn't disturbing me or anything, but I kind of felt the violence coming from him. Another guy came out. He reminds me of uh, an Alan Paul from Grace Community Church. Grace does not support this ministry. Grace is uh, is, a, is a is a community that I, by the by the mercy of God, I'm not exactly sure why I even stepped on that property, but. I should have never been there. You know, I mean, looking back today, I should have never had any association with Grace. Um, I would have never known the LGBTQ community. I would have never known that um, half of the stuff that I know today, I wouldn't know. So, I, I, in a way, I kind of regret it, you know. And um, but that's okay because God is sovereign over that too. Um, so, what we're doing is we're going to go through this, and this is this is brief. We're, we're not going to go in depth into the teaching. Uh, but we're going to read the verses, briefly talk about it, and maybe God will use this as seed into the heart of, you know, the, the soil of, 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 of Portland. Let me show you Portland right now. There's really not too many people, as you can see, that's the train. Uh, this is downtown. There's not too many people. There's nobody here. Okay, that's the, that's, that's the people waiting for, for the train here. You can look around. That's the Pioneer Square Park behind me. There's no activity there. And there's nobody. In, in, in the area, really. I mean, you've got the mall down the street, uh, right over there, that big uh, building, that's the mall. And so everybody's over there. This here is the Pioneer Square uh, Courthouse, and there's probably no sessions going on in there. But apart from that, there's really not much going on in Portland. Um, I guess just the clarity. Apart from um, what I'm doing here, there's no activity outside. Uh, you know, they're still protesting once in a while and uh, people getting hit, hurt, killed, and so on and so forth. You know, the usual pagan thing that people do. Um, we're gonna go through this, uh, and we're gonna try to do it within uh, half hour, 45 minutes, and hopefully God will be merciful and allow me to complete it. And, um, and, and pray as I'm, as I'm preaching that God will uh, use this message to reach um, as many people as possible in 2019 for his message. Uh, with his message and with his gospel message of salvation. So I'm going to go ahead and um, give them, pray, and then give them a calling, uh, remind them to, you know, to give. And I'm going to use uh, this big thing here that I have. I normally don't use use this, but for this series, I'm going to use it because um, when we did the series on, um, when, when we did the series on uh, uh, how much, how much, how much would you pay Jesus for all the works that you have done? One person responded and gave $100. Everybody else just shrugged and walked away. So I thought, okay, well, maybe uh, that's that's really all that God needed. Uh, this time, um, I'm hoping that somebody will have some kind of faith and say, well, let's 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 help this let's help this street rat. You know, <laughs> let's help this let's help this street rat uh, um, with this uh, with this with this ministry. Anyway, so let's begin. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you will bless this uh, this hour, this half hour, how much time you give me to preach to the people. I pray that you will work in the hearts of those that you have prepared to receive this message. You are sovereign over every single person that's out here today. Um, you are sovereign over the fact that they are created for this generation. You are sovereign over the fact that you brought them at the uh, Pioneer Square Park to specifically hear this message. Uh, and whatever word that you use to inspire their hearts for salvation, I pray that you will direct them to the scriptures so that they may be born again in Jesus' name. Okay, so that's our prayer, and so let's get started. Uh, as you can see, I still don't have any disciples uh, standing with me. I don't have any uh, church ministers uh, by my side. I am still doing a solo ministry. And um, hopefully God will have mercy on that. I'm going to announce for the church to give. Um, I apologize for the noise. If you hear a lot of noise, I'm going to move this a little bit this way. Good morning, Portland. My name is Kevin DeClaren. And uh, just want to take a few minutes to remind you of uh, the scriptures that is here in Portland. Besides all of the activities that you do, one other activity that people often forget is you can read the Word of God. Reading is a good activity. So watching television is great. Uh, playing video games is, is great, going dancing is great, um, going to a restaurant, but taking a few minutes and reading the Bible 
and applying it to your daily life, that's even better. Uh, there's our daily bread that you can uh, get for free at any uh, Christian bookstore. Uh, take some time, uh, pick one up, and you can even support uh, to read the Bible and use it as nourishment uh, for your soul. You don't ever want to uh, just feed your body, but remember to feed your soul also. For you Christians, as you know, the ministry uh, not only stands on the Word of God, but it also stands on your giving. It says here, uh, to all, all churches in Oregon, uh, need cash. That means need your cash support, uh, spiritual support, uh, prayer support. Um, why? Because the work of the ministry requires that you support us. Because if we're doing the work, um, we can only do one thing at a time. It's not for money. We do the work for the salvation of those who do not have and do not believe in our Lord Jesus. Right? So the goal of our ministry is to teach the world about our Lord Jesus. Remember the command is go make disciples of nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So our, 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 our responsibility as ministers, preachers, uh, evangelists is to preach the gospel of Jesus, which is what we're going to be doing uh, when we when, when we go in this direction here today with Romans, right? The Romans book, the book of Romans in the New Testament is about the gospel of Jesus and what that gospel does for us as a church, but not only as a church, but as a world. So we're preaching the book of Romans so that you may know and understand who Jesus is, what Jesus did, why he did it, and how it can affect your life today. So this is why we do the work. So if we're studying the scriptures and we're going into ministry and we're trying to make disciples of people, right? None of that is costly, but you have to understand there is a costing side. We live in a generation, we live in a generation where everything costs money. To make everything legitimate, we send it to the Library of Congress. And that costs $55. To make a copy of this book here, to make a copy of this book is gonna cost some cash. I need one copy for myself and a copy to send to the Library of Congress. And maybe in the future I can edit it and even publish it. All of that costs money. So if you're in the city and you wanna give, all you gotta do is put it in this basket here, right? I can put the basket right underneath this sign where it says Jesus, and whatever you give, it goes to his ministry. You can open the plastic, just don't rip it. You can open the plastic, put the money there, right? You already know what's on the other side, need cash, but I'd rather you remember the name Jesus than the reminder of needing cash, you understand? So we do the ministry to honor the name. Remember the scripture says, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess, that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Such negativity, such hate. We don't want that in the church. We don't want the negativity and the hate. God says, love thy neighbor, not hate that, thy neighbor, uh, despise thy neighbor, or cause thy neighbor to stumble. Anyway, let's get started. There is no such thing as Jesus. He's a prophet. You should know that by now. So I usually begin with connection, and uh, um, let me go ahead and pray us real quickly. Father, I pray for this afternoon. I pray for the, the message coming from Romans chapter 1. Pray that you will open the eyes of the blind, and you will soften the heart of the unbelieving. This I pray in Jesus' name, amen.
I usually begin with an announcement. I have a few things that I would like to say before I review real quickly and then go into an introduction and into our sermon for this afternoon. Um, at the beginning of the month, went to this, this uh, I guess it's a conference called Mission Connection Conference. It's uh, from a, a church in Tualatin. Uh, I had a real hard time getting there, but somebody was merciful and gave me a ride uh, to there. And I was very grateful that uh, I got to go there. The only, the only thing is, the only bad thing is, was that it's, it's so far away from public transportation that, um, you know, after leaving, I had to walk a long way to catch the bus. And even then, somebody gave me a ride back to downtown. Uh, keep this in mind, church. When you have a ministry out in the boonies, it's going to be very difficult for us who believe, whether you're preachers, your ministers, tra people traveling, we see your name and we see your ministry online. Um, keep in mind that public transportation may be our only option. So not everybody has a vehicle, you know, skateboards, uh, bicycles, uh, motorcycles or whatever to get there. So keep that in the back of your mind. Look at where your church is situated and see if there is a way you can either get a bus or to get out there or you can provide some form of transportation for people to get there because you know it's very it's very scary to walk a mile uh in pitch darkness and i'm not just talking about one church but i'm talking about all the churches you know you like you like that secluded spacey area but keep in mind that christians we are a target in every generation for satan our struggle is not against our brothers and sisters but, but it's against the powers of darkness, right? And if you're walking, and if you're a Christian walking in darkness, you never know what may come out to snatch you, to hurt you, to, to kill you. I hate to use that word, but you have to keep that in the back of your mind. So that was Mission Connection. Uh, the, the, uh, it was basically a, a, a group of, uh, of ministries advertising ways to connect. Um, and, and, and for Christians to get involved in supporting uh, the mission work that Jesus had given to the disciples to go make disciples of nation. God wants every single one of you to be a disciple while you're on earth so that upon your death, you don't, your soul and your spirit, your body will be buried, but your soul and your spirit does not enter into judgment, into hell. That's why we preach the gospel. That's why we remind you of the Lord's name and we remind you of what he did on the cross, right? Remember, he, he died on the cross. The Lord's name is Jesus. And what he did on the cross was that he died and he resurrected. And based on his resurrection, you and I now have what? We have access to God, the Father, and we also have forgiveness in his name. Um, I heard somebody say there's nothing more insulting than a street rat talking to you high. Well, I hate to upset you, but... When we Christians come out and we preach the gospel, we come out of seminary, we come out of the churches, there is nothing in the scriptures that says we're supposed to be millionaire. There's nothing in the scriptures that, that says we're supposed to be billionaire, right? Remember the apostle Paul, what was he? He was a homeless minister. Even Jesus says what? He had nowhere to lay his head. The focus and the goal of our message is your salvation and forgiveness because the time goes by like this, right? It goes really, really quickly. So I apologize if you've seen me in the streets camping out and I'm not sitting at the Hilton, which costs $200 a night or even here. Uh, I am going through a process. Uh, remember, I, I talked about the eviction in 2017. And as soon as I came out, I, I filled out applications for a new apartment and they told me, no, you cannot come in as a result of being evicted. It's a seven year hit. In other words, you have to stay in the streets for seven years or out of housing before you can get back in. It was never my plan. I had gotten a, um, a license I, I, with the state of Oregon. And when I got the new license, that was the hit because somebody does not want me to plant God's church. Keep in mind, the word says here, quoting Jesus at the bottom here, Jesus says, I will build my church. Underneath there, it says Matthew 16. Right? It says, I will build my church. The problem is, Haitian Cubans and other foreigners from other countries are going to have a real hard time planning God's church if the American side is not 
merciful, is not receptive, uh, who doesn't want to listen, they don't want to hear it. You know, we it, it's like we're too educated for you foreigners to come here with your broken English to try to minister to us, right? I mean, look at us, we're big, strong, tall, educated. All that information is on you too. We don't need your help. You would be surprised how many educated people are in hell. You would be surprised how many rich, beautiful Americans are in hell because of their pride and arrogance, God will not allow them to enter into the kingdom. Right? When you look at Matthew 16, when you, uh, when you look at Luke 16, when you look at Luke 16, Luke 16 has a rich man, right? He was probably tall, white, handsome, good looking, had all the girls in the city of where he was living at, um, and he had parties up the yin yang, right? Dressing himself up. But the problem is, is that because of his pride of all that he had and all that he was, uh, the Lord could not minister to his heart, right? Like the rich young ruler. Jesus says to the rich young ruler, what? You need to go sell everything and come and follow me. And he couldn't do it. He could not do it. He could not sell everything, get rid of everything to come and, 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 and humbly follow our Lord. So I apologize for being a, a street rat to some of you who don't really. I mean, if you really want to help, you can uh, put put to put the money in the tithing offering. You can open up the door for apartment complexes because I've been trying to put in application. I go to Home Forward and I call off the list. Um, I used to be able to sit there for an hour and call the entire list. Now they've shortened it to five five minutes, uh, fifteen minutes, and so it's really difficult when you're calling and you're trying to do the ministry. And um, you know, you're trying to find a place or trying to find a job and, 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 and doors are not opening. I have two resumes, uh, one for the church and one for the world. And you know, are, are the doors opening? Absolutely not. You know, and I put in re uh, uh, um, the resumes in, in different places to work, but they're not receptive. So there's nothing I could do about that. You know, um, Transition Projects has a, a, a phone message uh, machine and sometimes when it comes in, they delete it. And by the time I get there to ask, you know, can I have a, a copy of my messages? There's nothing there to give. Um, you know my situation with, uh, with Grace Community Church and Gabriel Franklin. The sexual assaults have never stopped and probably will not stop. I ended up contacting the Haitian embassy last week or the week before trying to uh, encourage them to come and remove Gabriel out of the situation. And so I, I, I've asked the uh, the Haitian embassy to come in Portland and to ask and to ask them basically to, to remove her so that the persecution will stop. You know the piercing of the feet, the uh, sexual assaults that are that that some of you might have witnessed, right? And so they haven't responded yet. We'll see what happens. Lawndale's Park, and this is just announcement. Lawndale's Park, this isn't a teaching. This is an announcement time, so I'm making some announcement. Uh, Lawndale's Park, right over there down the street. Remember, I had made an announcement in 2017 and 2018 and asked for the city to put doors there. No door have been put at Lawndale's Park. Instead, they've allowed the urinals to get overflowing and stopped up. What needs to happen? My brother does it in Mardi Gras. What What needs to happen? That's how he packs out 200 people. You tell them about the sin, and then they'll stop. Oh, yes. So, thank you for sharing that. Um, and so, the issue with the parks and recreation is, I had called them and left a message, hoping that somebody will, um, you know, while they're cleaning on, on, a, on a nightly basis, somebody will will put a, a plunge or, or some sort of a snake to undo the urinal for the public. It's really bad, really, really bad. It stinks and uh, somebody should encourage Parks and Recreation uh, to, to clean that up for, for us men. I don't know what it's like on the ladies side, but on the men's side, it's really unfortunate, but it's unsanitary and unclean. Um, as a way of review, the last time I was out here was on the 22nd. Um, and I think I had preached over there. 
And the title of the message was, The Soul That Sin Must Die. Coming from Ezekiel chapter 18, verses 1 through 9. Remember I read to you, um, as it says here in Ezekiel, The word of the Lord came to me, saying, What do you mean by using this proverb concerning the land of Israel, saying, The fathers eat the sour grapes, but the children uh, teeth are set on edge. As I, live, as I live, declares the Lord God, you are surely not going to use this proverb in Israel anymore. And then we focus on verse 4 more than any other verse. Verse 4 says, Behold, all souls are mine. The soul of the Father as well as the soul of the Son is mine. The soul who sins will die. And remember, I went into uh, the Old Testament and um, I went into Genesis. Remember in Genesis 2.17, uh, the scripture says, and, and this is God before talking to Adam and Eve about marriage and, 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 and his wife Eve, he says um, in Genesis 2, 17, he says, it is not good for, he says, From the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it, you shall surely die. That's when God began to talk to us about death. And then when you come into Ezekiel, Ezekiel 18, he talks about death again, and he says to the children of Israel, now this time, the soul who sins will die. This is around the time when um, the children of Israel was taken into captivity for 70 years because they were practicing idolatry. That's what God had against Israel. Uh, it was idolatry. And then when, we, when you come into the New Testament, you read, um, it is appointed for man to die once, and after this comes judgment. So God, through Ezekiel the prophet, spoke to us about death, the death of the body, right? In the Old Testament, it was the death of the body. And in Ezekiel, he talks about the death of the soul. And then in, 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 uh, in, in the New Testament, what is reaffirmed is, again, the death of the body. In other words, um, it is appointed for man to die once. Every single one of us, at some point in the future, is going to meet our maker in death, right? That's not something that you want to remember, but it's in the obituaries every day in the, new, in the Portland uh, uh, newspaper, right? We're constantly reading about uh, each other's family members parting from us. So the soul that sin must die. And upon our death, remember the body is separated from the spirit. So one, we have to experience the death of the body and two, the death of the soul. And that is why we preach Jesus. The purpose of preaching Jesus is to prevent the soul from being judged. The reason why we preach Jesus, even our Lord had to experience the first death. You see, here is the first death, even God, Son has to experience the first death. So that means every single one of us at some point in the future will die. But we Christians are sent out to preach the gospel to prepare you for the second death. The second death is your soul going into hell. Your soul going into Hades. Your soul going into a place called the lake of fire. Jesus can prevent you from going into the lake of fire. That's why his arm is open wide and saying, believe in my name first before you enter into eternal judgment. So if you believe in his name, you don't have to enter into eternal judgment. You can enter into eternal life, which is what he was trying to give us from the very beginning. If only Adam and Eve had eaten from the fruit of what? Not from the fruit of the uh, good and evil, but from the other tree, and he did not do that. The tree of life, eternal life. So we're given a second chance. Jesus is the second chance to enter into eternal life. Will you, Americans, take it today? If you will, bow the knee right now. Say, Lord, forgive me for my sin. I repent of my sin right now. Don't wait till the message is over. Do it now. Do it right now. And at the end of the message, the conclusion was, repent and do not die. Repent and do not die. Remember in 2019, we began the year by pursuing uh, Solomon's wisdom in Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 1, verses 2 12, right? We went through Ecclesiastes. Solomon was a king full of the wisdom of God. 
And you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't feel like after preaching a series, it doesn't feel like the city has gotten anything out of it because nobody ever responds. They think it's me talking to them. No, it is my mouth talking and my voice talking, but the author of what I'm saying is God himself. In other words, it's the Lord that sends his message through his messengers. And this is the Lord's message to you. It is what? His son's death will allow you to enter into where he's at. If you don't receive his son and you don't receive the death and you don't believe in the resurrection of the Christ, you will never meet God face to face. You will never be received into his kingdom. Some of you are going to celebrate the life of your friends and family this year, like you did last year. And they're going to have to deal with the issue of not having had, what? Repented of their sins. They took the gospel lightly. They mocked, they ridiculed the church, and they ignored the warnings of God. Today you're being warned in what? In January. Where will you be in December? You may not even be here in December. I may not be here in December, right? To what? To, to, to welcome the birth. Look at us. We're in January looking at the death. Some of you may not even be here in December to welcome the birth of the Messiah. So you've, you've heard the announcement. You understand the review? Our introduction, Romans 1, 16, 1 through 16, is our goal in our series for this year. Why? Why choose Romans? Because man is condemned. Every person that you see here is condemned. Every child born is condemned. Every man, every woman is condemned, right? Condemned to what? Condemned to hell unless they believe in the name of Christ. Condemned to hell. So at this very hour, you know, and, and some people don't even care, right? They don't understand the pain that's coming up ahead without Christ. They don't understand that there's pain coming. There's pain coming for rejecting that name. There is pain coming. Did he suffer pain? Look at the pain. Can you, can you take this hit? Look at the hit. This is the hit that the Roman Empire is known for, the crucifixion. Can you take that hit? Would you, husbands, take that hit to, sa to save your wives and children? Would you, husbands, take that hit to be crucified to save your mom and your dad, your brothers, your sisters, you know, Americans love to boast on how much they love each other, right? We, we go to war and we're fighting for the country, we're fighting and there's a, a 16,000, 20,000 troops, everybody's getting in, everybody's going to, to the war with a gun. What if the government says, we want you now to go to Iraq, to Iran, without a gun, and just a verbal message, believe on the name of Donald Trump and will allow you pardon. You Don't bring no gun, don't bring no knife, don't bring no sword, don't bring no bomb, don't bring no jets, that's gonna, don't, no nuclear weapon, don't bring anything. Just go there, you yourselves, and you profess the name of Donald Trump. We'll forgive you for your offenses at 9-11, and, 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 and we'll, we'll say bye, God, and bye. But if you don't, every single one of you are gonna drop dead and go to hell. Is not any different than Christ being sent. Look at him on the cross, right? Look at him on the cross. This is the message that we reject as children. We reject as parents. But how many of us would take that position, right, to save our loved ones? We go across the nation, around the world, to save our loved ones, not in the position of Christ, but in the position of an army, right? A Navy, an Air Force, a Marine. Our fellow brethren, we go to bomb them. And then give money after we bomb them. The man says, and give them food after we bomb them. So food and bombs, bombs and food. Foods and bombs, bombs and food. We'll give them, yeah, pop cars, uh, radioactive metals. I mean, Things that I do not know because I'm not in the army. No. But the point that I'm making is this, is that how far would you go to save your loved ones? You would what? Establish an army, an air force, a navy, a marines. Now they're even thinking about putting what? An airspace. To put an army of people in space. Wow. We struggled in the 1960s to send one man to the moon. Now we're thinking of putting a whole fleet of people in space to fight off who? Japan, China, 
right. These are our brothers that are living right here with us. Why do we need, I mean, look at how far we will go to fight off our enemies. But Jesus, to fight off the enemy, says what? I'll give you my life and my blood right there on the cross. To bring you into the kingdom of God, to bring you to where my father's at, to, to conquer that fallen nature. To keep you from suffering the pain that you're about to endure, the pain of hell. Not just the pain in your flesh, but the pain in your soul for eternity. People get shot and they die instantly. But then, the person who got shot, was their soul saved? Was their soul saved? In 2018, in December of 2018, we completed four videos introducing this series, Paul's Love Letter to a Gentile Church, right, under a tyrannical empire and emperor. Now, I really want to go quickly here through, this, through, through a couple points in the preface of this book. Not the entire thing, just a couple points, right? I want to look at... Um, If we were to go back, we're still dealing with the introduction here. If we were to go back 3,000 years, 3,000, 4,000 years ago, what would we be dealing with, right? If I was to give you a background, go all the way back, not 2,000 years, but a little bit further back, further back than 2,000 years, right? Basically, the preface gives us the background, the range, you know, the setting, the, you know, setting the stage to introduce this author named Paul, to introduce the letter, the issues, the problems, basically the subjects, the scope of and, and, and aim of what Paul was talking about in his letter, right? Solutions to further the gospel, you know, or, or, or to be mindful of its opponents in opposition. So that's basically what the preface is all about. If we went 3,000 years ago, right, instead of two, or maybe even 4,000 years B.C. before Christ, right, and we looked at the history from 3,000 years B.C. to about 28 B.C., right, what would we be looking at? Creation, right, the beginning of all creation, the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We'd be looking at the Abrahamic covenant, right, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant, uh, the deportation, of Israel, and I'm talking about biblically, right? And of course, the return from the deportation and the preparation for the coming of Messiah. So if we went back about 3,000, 4,000 years ago um, to, right, to about 28 BC. When you get to 27 BC though, from 27 BC, right, which is around the time that the Roman Empire started, I wanna read you this article here that I got from the internet, and um, it says this. In 27 BC, Gaius Julius Caesar Octavius, Oct uh, Octavianus, was awarded the uh, honorific title of Augustus by a decree of the Senate. So began the Roman Empire and the Principate of the Julio Claudians. It says here, August 27th, BC 14 AD. Right? Augustus, I pronounced that wrong. Let me repeat that. It says, so, so, so began, this isn't my article. This is an article that I got from someone else. He says, the, the author of the article, uh, Christopher Lightfoot, says, so began the Roman Empire and the Principate of the uh, Julio Claudians. Augustus, it has, uh, it says 27 BC, he was, he was one of the, um, He was one of the Caesars from 27 BC to 14 AD. And then Tiberius was also from 14 uh, AD to 37 AD. And then Gaius Germanicus, known as Caligula, was a Caesar uh, from 37 uh, AD to 41 AD. And then Claudius was a Caesar from 41 AD to 54 AD. And then Nero uh, was a, a was a Caesar from 54 AD to 68 AD. So from the beginning uh, with Augustus to Nero. Nero is uh, the one that was in charge and Nero was the one who did this to Paul, okay? 
So the man here that you see that's about to get his head chopped off, that's Paul the Apostle. This is how he's depicted uh, in some art artist's drawing. And it was during the time of Nero that he had his head cut off. Nero was emperor uh, and Caesar from 54 to 68 AD. He says here, the Julio uh, Claudians, the Roman nobles with an impressive ancestry, maintain Republican ideals and wish to involve the Senate and other Roman aristocrats in the government. Uh, this, however, eventually led to a decline in the power of the Senate and the extension of imperial control through equestrian officers and imperial freedmen. Uh, he says, peace and prosperity were maintained in the provinces and foreign policy, especially under Augustus and Tiberius. He says, relied uh, more on diplomacy than military force. He says, with, with, with its borders, secure and a stable central government, the Roman Empire enjoyed a period of pros prosperity, uh, technological advance, great achievements in the arts, and flourishing trade and commerce. Right. He says, um, he says, under Caligula, this is the, uh, uh, the, the, Caligula was the emperor from 37 AD to 41 AD. He says, under Caligula, much time and revenue were devoted to extravagant games and spectacles while under Claudius, the empire, and especially Italy and Rome itself, benefited from the emperor's uh, administrative reforms and enthusiasm for public work programs. He says, and this is, uh, we only have a, a, a few more uh, sentences here. He says, imperial expansion brought about colonization, urbanization, and the extension of the Roman citizenship in the provinces. The succeeding emperor, Nero, was a connoisseur and patron of the arts. He also extended the frontiers of the empire, but antagonized the upper class and failed. <laughs> and failed to hold the loyalty of the Roman legions. Amid rebellion and civil war, the Julio-Claudian dynasty came to an in glorious end with Nero's suicide in 68 AD. So Nero, the man who had the Apostle Paul beheaded, committed suicide, what seemed to be the year after Paul was killed. I want to read you one more point in the preface here of this book. Um, so I read once that Paul was the guy who really started Christianity. Like he was the main it wasn't. That's who started Christianity. Jesus. The final point for this preface, and I just want to make a real quick, I want to bring you back to the scriptures now. The birth of Messiah. The birth of Messiah occurred under Augustus. The birth of Messiah uh, occurred under Augustus, um, probably around uh, 1 to 4 AD. So he was the one that was uh, uh, the emperor at that time. You know the passage in Matthew 1, uh, 18 through 25, and Luke chapter 1 and 2. You who are Christians can read it, or you who are not yet Christians and would like to be Christians, you should read it. Uh, you know, it begins with now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And you know the story. Uh, the scripture says that, um, and Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace or plan to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who, was, uh, who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And the verse continues, for he, will, Joshua. For, he, for he will save his people from their sins. Right? Uh, now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Right? Behold, the virgin shall be with child, and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. 
And Joseph awoke from his sleep and did as the angel of the Lord commanded him and took Mary as his wife, but kept her a virgin until she gave birth to a son and he called his name Jesus. So that's gonna be the end of our uh, introduction real briefly, but for our, 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 our sermon message, we're gonna go over into um, Romans chapter one. Romans chapter one. Now I've entitled this chapter, God's Gospel, Attributes and Judgments Against Unrighteous Men. So we have God's Gospel, which is in chapter one, verses one through six. And then we have God's attributes and then judgment against unrighteous men. So we wanna read through Romans chapter one here. All right. Have a nice day, man. Likewise. When you come to Romans chapter 1, we have several points. The first point is the gospel of God. Chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. And I've done um, the gospel of God before. I did it when I was in Seattle, Washington. You all know the gospel of God because that's what we've been talking about for the last seven years. That's what uh, Evangelist Graham has taught for 60 years. His son Franklin took, took up the, the mantle and has been doing it all over the United States and all over the world, continuing his father's ministry, the gospel of God. So Paul writes this letter. Um, so Paul writes this letter to the church of Rome and um, and in verses one through six, he says, Paul, a, a bond servant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. If I were to explain word for word, verse by verse, everything that Paul had written here, we'd be here until the end of the day. So to spare you the rod, we're going to give you the summary of the chapter, or, or, of the passages, and maybe briefly hit on what Paul is saying here. The gospel of God is what I, I've been giving you since I started preaching. What is it? It's about the birth of Jesus, which I read in Matthew, the death of Jesus that we talked about, you see here in the photograph, right? And you, the American government and the American people having a responsibility to accept it, to receive it, so you could be forgiven for your sin, right? Paul was called as an apostle. He wasn't always an apostle. What was he? He was a Pharisee who was against the gospel of God. He was a Pharisee who was against Jesus Christ. He was a Pharisee who stood by watching Stephen being stoned to death. Stephen was a preacher, and Paul apparently had to take his position after God had forgiven him and confronted him through, uh, through our Lord Jesus. It says here that the gospel was promised beforehand. We can read it in Isaiah. Isaiah was one of the prophets who had prophesied of the coming of Messiah. And we read that in, in Matthew earlier, right? Through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning who his son, who was born of a descendant of David, right? So David, it goes all the way back. But anyway, uh, we're going to move on real quickly here. Uh, uh, continuing from uh, verse 6, we're going to look at verse 7, the recipients and the greetings. Paul says, to all who are beloved of God in Rome, called as saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So this is how they greeted um, each other. And this is how they made known whom, whom, who was going to be the recipient of the letter. Right? All who are beloved of God, all who are Christians of God in Rome. He was talking to everybody that was the church in Rome at that time. 
when he wrote this letter, called as saints. He says, God is bestowing his grace to you and his peace, right? Coming from our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verses 8 through 15, we see Paul prays and desires to visit and preach the gospel to Gentile Christians, right? So from verses 8 to 15, Paul says this, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. Who's for you all, for all of you Christians, right? So he prays and he gives God thanks for all the Christians. Why? Because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world, right? Your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world, not just in Jerusalem. Not just in Jerusalem, but now in Rome. Remember, um, the emperor had sent, the emperor Nero had sent troops, right, Romans, uh, Roman guards down to Remember in our introduction, Tiberius, I believe, was the uh, emperor who had, uh, Tiberius was the emperor who had sent the Roman Empire, or who was the Caesar at the time, when Christ was crucified. And so he sent, um, he, he, he had his army down there, probably persecuting the church in Israel, um, because it was at that time that Jesus was, uh, was crucified. Well, years later, the Lord sent the disciples up to Rome, right? And, and basically he reversed it and he sent them the gospel, this gospel here. So they came down with swords and clubs and, and knives to kill uh, Israel and the church. But the Lord, he didn't send anything else other than what? The message about Jesus. This is what the Lord said. This is what God said to Rome. Not only to Tiberius, but to all the emperors. They came with swords, we came with Jesus. And that's how it is with missionaries. That's what it's been for 2,000 years. Christians, don't forget to give to support the ministry. You wanna take the street rat off the street, right? And put them in housing somewhere. So he says, first I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all, because your faith is being proclaimed throughout the whole world. For God whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his son is my witness as to how unceasingly, never stopping, unceasingly I make mention of you. So he's constantly praying for them. Always in my prayers, making requests. If perhaps now at last, by the will of God, I may succeed in coming to you. So he's been praying to God that he would have an opportunity to go to Rome and to meet with them, to pray with them, to lay hands on them so that the Holy Spirit could fall upon those who do not yet believe among them. He says in verse 11, for I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established, that is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. Paul has an agenda. He wants to go to Rome, meet with the church, and especially those who are fresh and new in Christ. If he lays his hands on them, the Spirit of God will call, come upon them and will bless them with what? Spiritual gifts. He says in verse 13, I do not want you to be unaware, brethren, that often I have planned to come to you and have been what? Prevented so far, so that I may obtain some fruit among you also. The same way he would have put his hands on them so that they would receive the Holy Spirit and that they would bless with the spiritual gift. He himself would have benefited by receiving gifts from them, right? It's sort of like exchanging presents. He says, even as among the rest of the Gentiles, I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So for my part, I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. So he's taken the gospel out of Jerusalem and brought it to Rome. When we look at verses 16 and 17 of chapter one, the gospel is the power and righteousness of God, says Paul. He says to the church, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, and also to all of you Greeks, all of you Haitians, all of you Italians, all of you French, 
all of you Germans, all of you Russians, all of you Africans, right? It says salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first, to Israel, and then to the rest of the world. For in it, in the gospel of God, is the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, right? From the Jewish faith to what? To the New Testament faith. As it is written, the righteous man shall live by faith. Who is the righteous man in our generation living by faith? Who in our generation is living by faith and not by facts, right? Not to insult you because you know my way and manner of life. I feel that I have uh, enough confidence in me to say that to you and not offend you. Right? Who has enough faith in Jesus in this generation to live by faith and not the other? Right? Paul says in verses 18 through 25, right, which is the dishonor and wrath of God against what? Unbelief. Why unbelief? Remember, the just shall live by faith. There are some who have no faith. So what does God give to the man that has no faith? Wrath. Right? You can't give him, you can't give him salvation if he doesn't believe in the name, the only name by which men are to be saved, right? The only name by which men are to be saved. So what do you give? He says, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness, a person living without God, all unrighteousness, a person living without any kind of righteousness within their soul and spirit, right? So the wrath of God is against what? Ungodliness, unrighteousness of what? Men, women, and children who suppress the truth in what? Unrighteousness. Because that which is known about God is evident within them. When God made every single one of us, what he wanted us to know about him is already in you. He says, for God made, made it evident to them. For since the creation of the world, Genesis 1, his, his invisible attributes, his eternal power, divine nature, have been clearly seen being understood through what has been made right so when you see creation you understand that these are this is a manifestation of god's what attributes his invisible attributes he says being understood through what has been made created right so that they are without excuse can i tell you something i have an obligation to preach the gospel because of creation salvation and eternity what christian does not feel that upon them we have, a, 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 we have an obligation to preach the gospel because we have been created. We have an obligation to preach the gospel because we have been saved. We have an obligation to preach the gospel because we will live eternally on the other side of God's wrath. So Paul says, so that they are without excuse. You unbelievers, when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, he's going to say, you don't have an excuse because I put it in you. You knew who I was and you heard the messages, but you chose to be proud. For even though they knew God, verse 21, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, right? They didn't honor him as the creator and give him thanks for what they had received. But they became futile in their speculation and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing to be wise, they became fools and exchange the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man and of birds and four-footed animals and crawling creatures. Idolatry. They turned to idolatry like the children of Israel did in what? In Exodus, when they made the golden calf. God was not pleased with that. He was angry and he judged them, right? And he smashed the, 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 the two tablets and Moses had to go back up to get new tablets. We see in verse 24 through 25, God gave man over to lust and impurity. Paul says, therefore God gave them over in the lust of their hearts to impurity, so that their bodies would not be dishonored, would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. He says in verses 26 through 27, God gave man over to degrading passions and same sex. He says, for this, beginning in verse 26, for this reason God gave them over to degrading passions, for their women exchange the natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way also the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own purses the due penalty of their error. Homosexuality, lesbianism, 
LGBTQ, lesbians, gays, bisexual, transgender, queer, that's what the community has become, who rejected the gospel of God. The LGBTQ is the community that is under the wrath of God. The LGBTQ is the group that says no to Jesus and his birth and his resurrection and his crucifixion. Christians, don't forget to give and support the ministry. So our last point, verses 28 through 32, God gave man over to a depraved mind. So, and just as they did not see fit to acknowledge God any longer, this is in Paul's generation, right? Under who? Remember who the, the, the emperor is, Nero? Under Nero, he's talking to them. He says, and just as they did not see fit any longer, right? God gave them over to a, a depraved mind to do those things which are not proper. Not only were they turned over to homosexuality, but they were filled with unrighteousness, wickedness, greed, evil, envy, murder, strife, deceit, malice, gossip, slandering, haters of God, insolent, arrogant, boastful, inventors of evil, disobedient to parents, without understanding, untrustworthy, unlovely, unmerciful, and although they know the ordinance of God, that those who practice such things are worthy of death, they not only do the same, but also give hearty approval to those who practice them. So they got really ticked off in Rome. The Romans were outraged at Paul's teaching. The Romans were angry. And Paul wrote it down for the church and said, this is what's going on in the world today concerning the gospel of God. So understand these eight points, right? Beginning in verse 1 through 32. We see the gospel of God, chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Recipients and greetings, verse 7. Paul prays, desires to visit and preach the gospel to Gentile Christians, verses 8 through 15. We see the gospel is the power and righteousness of God, verses 16 through 17. We see the dishonor and wrath of God against unbelief, which is verses 18 through 23. We see God gave man over to lust and impurity, verses 24 through 25. We see God gave man over to degrading passions and same sex, verses 26 through 27. We see God gave man over to a depraved mind, verses 28 through 32. So in conclusion, when we summarize this chapter, understand that Paul has written to a body of believers in the city of Rome, in the country of Italy, not to one person, right, only, but to a church. He addresses the issue of the gospel. This is concerning the Son of God, Jesus, who resurrected from the dead. He expresses a desire to visit them and bless them, though he has not though he has been held back himself by persecution, right? He explained that a man has been cursed three times and turned over by God because they refused to honor him as God. So God has given man over to a life of misery and sin. God is calling you to salvation today, right? God is calling all men to himself today. He calls you Americans living in Portland, Oregon, right? As a result of this message that you have heard, right? So let today be the day of your salvation, all of you, whether you're an American or not, whether you're a citizen or not, whether you're a visitor or not, right? The day you reconcile to God once and for all is the day of your salvation. Let today be that day. Will it be that day to each and every one of you? Paul says to the church in 2 Corinthians, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them. And he has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. We beg you, Americans, on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. We beg you. Paul writes to the church of Corinth and begs them to be reconciled to God. Why? Because of the coming judgment. He made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Remember what I asked you, how far would you go to protect your American families, right? You would form an army 
to send them to the country that's threatening you to fight them? Would you go to the cross for your family? Would you die on the cross with nothing for your family, right? So, he, so like Paul, today's church message has not changed, right? Therefore, we also ask you who do not have faith today, you who are living the American way of life, you who are rich, powerful, influential, you who have great families, right? We're asking you to have faith. We're asking you to confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. If you want to be saved, all you have to say is Father or Lord, right? Please hear my prayer. Please forgive me of my life of sin. I repent. I seek your pardon, your forgiveness, restoration, and reconciliation. Please grant me your Holy Spirit and a new life in our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You may not feel anything. You may not see a violent wind, but God hears your heart's prayer and he will respond to it accordingly. So to close this message, I want to finish with a, a closing prayer just by saying Father you are in heaven we praise you we thank you for this new year 2019 we now pray for all those who have called upon your name for salvation please grant them the forgiveness and reconciliation that they need to seek Grant them the ability to repent by faith and seek a holy life in Christ by faith. Amen. One last thing. Father, bless your church with mercy, grace, and forgiveness for their own sins. Let not the evil one mislead us, misguide us, distract us from obeying your word. Give us an eternal love for your truth until our Lord returns. Draw your modern church leaders to prayer, evangelism, Bible study, shepherding, and discipleship. This we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Remember to give. I noticed nobody came forward to give. Not sure why the Spirit is not leading you to give. Maybe you need to go through the process of salvation first. But I'm hoping that the church will support by faith. 